everyone, and welcome to this next edition of the Breaking Down Barrier series. My name is Jenna Heilman, Executive Director of HDYO, and I'm so thrilled to have two people joining me today as we talk about the many different stigmas and misunderstandings around this crazy elusive term called biomarkers. So joining me today, I have the wonderful Dr. Sarah Tabrizi and then one of our ambassadors, Molly, both coming in from the UK. Um, but first, I'd love to have them introduce themselves. Dr. Tabrizi, I'll get started with you. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Tabrizi. I am a Huntington's disease researcher. I've been working um, uh, on this disease for the last 25 years. And um, I'm passionate about taking what we know to develop therapies for Huntington's disease. So very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, that's phenomenal. And Molly. Hi, my name is Molly. I'm from Northern Ireland, but I live in Birmingham as I am a PhD researcher at the University of Birmingham. So my mum has Huntington's disease and a lot of my extended family do. And for my PhD, I'm looking at social cognition in Parkinson's, which is a closely related condition. And in the future, I would love to translate the research I've done in Parkinson's into Huntington's. That's tremendous. We see that so much in young people as they are getting more involved in the community. Many people turn to the research arm of the, of the community. So it's an important work that both of you are doing. Dr. Tabrizi, I'm curious, how did you first decide to um, focus on Huntington's disease? What was that journey like? Um, I was doing my PhD, which was on um, the role of mitochondria, which is the um, part of the cell that produces energy um, in brain diseases. And I was working on Parkinson's and Huntington's. And then I met um, people with Huntington's disease during my PhD, and I was really struck by um uh the disease the um how relatively young they were um how the disease affected them and also being a disease of families as well as individuals so um i became really um interested in the disease and and very much wanted to try and um, join the community to try and make a difference to this disease. So it was really meeting people with the disease in the, in the late 90s that uh, got me interested and, and motivated. I love that. And I think that that's, we continually advocate for or encourage community members when you're at conferences and have the opportunity to meet science, the science community to chat with them and share your story because there is such a need for the two groups to work together and um and just by meeting people in the community you were inspired to really take on this really important cause absolutely to and that absolutely that, keep doing that people keep reaching out and sending messages and talking with the science community because it really does matter well let's let's dive right into this topic of my biomarkers and and i know that Molly, you kind of have one foot in each door with the HDN science communities. Think back, though, um, before you were re a researcher and studying research um, specifically in Parkinson's, but what did you know about biomarkers and what were your initial thoughts when you started to hear that term? Yeah, so truthfully, before I entered into research, I knew very little, if anything, about biomarkers. I did study biology at A level, but it wasn't even something that we learned about at that point. And it definitely wasn't common knowledge in my family and it wasn't something that we'd actually discussed before. Yeah, and I don't think that that's, it's, I don't think that that's an uncommon story at mm. all. Um, you know, it's, because uh, why would you? You know, mm. why, unless you're really engrossed in science, would you hear about that? So what was that journey like as you started to get further into your studies? Um, how did you start to really dive into biomarkers and, and how did that evolve for you, Molly? So I was very fortunate to have studied pharmacology up to master's degree, mm -hmm. and it enabled me to learn about, about, about biomarkers in lectures and through reading scientific papers. But if I hadn't have completed my degree, Maybe other things I would have considered would be reading things like HD Buzz, which is a plain language summary of HD research. 
And there's a very good article on there that I've actually found by Dr. Leora Fox. And she explains what biomarkers are and how this protein called neurofilament light chain may be used in the future as a biomarker in Huntington's. So I think as scientists and researchers learn more and more about biomarkers in a number of different medical conditions, whether that be cancer or Huntington's, and learn about their benefits in diagnosing medical conditions, it will get out into mainstream media more and more and might be more commonly spoke about in public. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that with people who are watching, you might think, why do I need to know about biomarkers? And we're going to dive into that in that in this conversation because education is so empowering. And as you start to hear some of these common terms, you may find that you've actually already heard of some of these. You maybe don't understand what they do or how they're measured, but you may think, wow, I actually know more about biomarkers. I just don't ever call it that. But I think that education is such a, a, a powerful tool. So as we start to transition, Dr. Tabrizi, let's break it down. What exactly is a biomarker? So a biomarker um, really is a biological measure. Um, and it's an objective measure that we use to inform us about a, 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 the state of an individual. Um, and it can, and it has to be something that can be measured accurately and reproducibly wherever the biomarker is measured. So there are different types of biomarker. Um, if we think about Huntington's disease, there is a diagnostic biomarker, which would potentially be the genetic test. There is biomarkers. There are biomarkers of disease progression. For example, clinical stating, your clinical state, thinking tests, your neurological examination, motor examination. Um, it could be imaging, brain imaging, um, and it can also be biofluids like NFL. So they're all can be biomarkers of disease progression. And then we have safety biomarkers, which are an indication that uh, uh, something may be damaging or safe. And then we have biomarkers that we call target engagement biomarkers. And they're the biomarkers to tell you if a drug in a person is doing what it should do, uh, uh, for example, is it interacting with its target? And the reason that's important is if you're in a, a trial, for example, something that's trying to lower the Huntington protein, the mutant Huntington protein, you want a measure ideally in a fluid that's linked to the brain, like cerebral spinal fluid, that, that, that you are actually lowering your target. And that's called a target engagement biomarker. So the diagnostic biomarker, disease progression biomarker, or a, a state biomarker is sometimes called um, safety biomarker and target engagement biomarkers are the ones we typically use, and they're all research terms. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, so just to kind of recap, this is a tool that's used to measure some kind of thing in people, whether it's um, a disease progression, whether it is even in placebo. So as you're looking at getting involved, you're looking at biomarkers for just normal age progression, for example, versus the progression of a disease to kind of even think about it in Huntington's disease. Um, but it's really a tool on the research end to be able to determine many different aspects about- That's right. And I think the reason- we hear about it a lot. And the reason it's important is when we test something in research, we need to understand the effects of what we're testing. And that is typically done in clinical trials where there is an intervention or in observational studies like in Roll, it is done through the measurement of a number of different things that we call biomarkers. They're, it's basically biological measures. No, I think that that's really helpful to understand and, and some of the complexities, but um, 
as we dive specifically into Huntington's disease, can you share about what are some of those biomarkers um, with HD? I know we've talked a little bit about neurofilament light, but I don't know that people really understand what it is. So could you please share a little bit about those different biomarkers? So um, we have diagnostic biomarker, which is the Huntington's genetic test. Um, and um, the reason this can be thought of as a diagnostic biomarker is bec before the gene was found, um, when people were making a diagnosis of Huntington's disease in people with potentially with a family history, because they didn't have a genetic test, they had to be very, very sure that the people had the disease. And that led to the disease um, being diagnosed when there was very clear, unmistakable clinical signs, which was typically the, the career or the movements. And that led to the diagnosis of Huntington's disease occurring pretty late in the disease um, uh, because there wasn't the diagnostic genetic test. And the everyone talks about neurofilament. So neurofilament is a marker from neurons or brain cells, and it's actually from the axons of the brain cells, which are the part that connects it to that connects them to other uh, brain cells. So basically, that's how they communicate with each other. And when nerve cells break down a little bit, uh, a neurofilament is released, and it's released into the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds the brain. It's also released into the blood through that process. And there are a number of things that can cause an increase in that neurofilament. For example, if you uh, have a boxing match, um, there is a big increase in neurofilament after doing a bout of boxing. This has been measured. If you have a head injury, uh, a neurofilament can go up suddenly and acutely like a boxing match. But in brain diseases like Huntington's disease and Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's, and actually a multiple sclerosis as well, neurofilament slowly increases with disease progression. It also increases with aging. So someone who's 60 will have higher neurofilament than someone who's 20, because it is also part of aging. But neurofilament has turned is looking like it's going to turn out important in Huntington's disease for a number of reasons. It goes up with disease progression. It looks like it might be a very early sensitive marker of the disease that we can measure in spinal fluid. And also it is turning out to also be a useful safety biomarker in clinical trials and also potentially a biomarker in clinical trials of whether something is saving neurons. And I'll just break that down a bit for you. So neurofilament goes up with disease progression and it goes up with aging, but we can control for the age effects. If you have a drug or an intervention that lowers neurofilament below what we would expect as part of the disease, then people get excited because that potentially tells you that you're saving brain cells. If neurofilament goes down, that is good news because it means that you are saving brain cells. If neurofilament goes up in a clinical trial, we now know there are two reasons. One reason might be because there's neurosurgery involved for example, with the gene therapy trial that Unicure are running, you, a, a, a neurofilament goes up in the first year because there is a big neurosurgical procedure and then it begins to come down. Neurofilament going up without a neurosurgical procedure in a clinical trial is an indication potentially that nerve cells are unhappy and that the drug has done something to increase neurofilament. So lots of complex terms, but the bottom line is, is if neurofilament goes up in a clinical trial, then, then we don't want that to happen. 
if it goes down in a clinical trial and it goes down below what we would expect, that's really good news. Mm -hmm. And the FDA and regulators have given licenses and approved drugs based on neurofilament going down together with clinical improvement in diseases like motor neuron disease, which means that it may be a marker for our in Huntington's disease that if neurofilament goes down in a clinical trial over and above what we would expect with the disease, and if it's a difference between placebo and those getting the drug, it might be that neurons are being saved. And so that's something that's a really hot topic in clinical trials at the moment. Mm -hmm. So going up is bad, going down is good. Yeah, that seems more complex because I think that if you've been able to follow along with some of the clinical trials, that was a big potential safety question, as Dr. Tafrizi mentioned. But as this post hoc analysis, um, these uh, further understandings of what is the lifespan of the, the, the disease progression impacted by these clinical trials. We're learning a lot more. I think that's why it's really important to understand that even if a, if a trial stops, that there are, um, there are a lot of good information that we take from that to either further understand the drug or the treatment to be able to adjust it for another study or to help other studies learn more about the disease so they can make adjustments to their trials. That's exactly. So everything, even when a trial is stopped, everything, that trial is, has still been very useful because the way we will get therapies is by different trials and learning from each trial. And each trial adds a bit of information. And we've learned a lot about neurofilament from the trials and using that in new trials going forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Molly, you wanted to jump in with a comment? Yeah, so I think that was explained really well. And I really understand now a bit more about neurofilament. But I kind of, for the benefit of the community members, I just wanted to describe what neurofilament is, maybe in layman's terms. Mm. And um, a, a good metaphor that I've kind of heard for neurofilament is that it's like the spines of the umbrella. So it supports mm. the cells. And when, you know, the, you're going through neuron degeneration or the nerve cells dying, this neurofilament, which is like the spines of the umbrella supporting the cell, is then released from the cell. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that in. That's very good. That's lovely. Yeah, we're just talking about neurofilament a lot. And I appreciate that some people will be like, what is that? No, it gets really complicated. And the, the acronym is NFL. So when you hear in research presentations or see it um, in writing, when you when you see that term NFL, that's exactly what we're talking about, exactly what Molly described and what Dr. Tabrizi described as well. So thank you for that. Um, but there's there are more biomarkers with Huntington's disease. You hear some things like the TFC score. You hear these other terms whenever people are breaking down research information and, and even the understanding of how um, quality of life takes in and, you know, are there specific um, and, 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 and I've already named some of them, but are there also specific biomarkers that have to deal with symptom progression uh, outside of just specifically the disease progression itself. Yeah, so those are what we would um, typically call clinical state or stage biomarkers. And um, they are how a person's feeling, um, uh, how a person is thinking, like thinking tests. Digital measures are also talked about a lot in, in studies now. And that's when someone has a smartphone or a watch that monitors activity or they have you have to do a walking test or a tapping test and that's digital biomarkers because they're measured through a watch or a, a smartphone um, and they are the TFC for example which is a function how are you feeling how is your job how are you managing things um, that's a functional measure there's the total motor score which is measuring your motor function. There's thinking tests and a, and a very common one that we all hear about is the symbol digit 
modality test, which is SDMT. And that's a thinking test, which is um, looks at different parts of the brain and is actually very sensitive. And it's part of the staging system. So these are all clinical biomarkers. And then we have bio imaging biomarkers, which are used a lot, which is biomarkers of the caudate or the putamen or the in parts of the brain affected in Huntington's disease or the whole brain volume. So people talk about imaging biomarkers, biomarkers from fluid, like we talked about NFL, and then linking them importantly to how people feel, how they function, um, uh, how they think, um, how their uh, uh, neurological function is, and that's clinical biomarkers, as Jenna said. Yeah. I mean, thinking from the community perspective, that's a lot to try to keep straight. And I think the important thing is to know that um, that it's not your job to keep them all straight. No, it's no, you don't need to worry about it. The reason it's important is because we need them to do clinical trials to test if something is making a difference because the only way to test in clinical trials if something is making a difference is through biomarkers. So biomarkers are important for research. They're not important for anything else, only for research. Well, I think that it's... Um... Huntington's disease is just so complicated and impacts so many different pieces of it. And it seems like, you know, one, because of those complexities, you need all these different biomarkers because not everybody is affected the same way on the physical side of it. When you think about how the disease is presenting, whether um, to the outside community, to caregivers. So it's important to understand what's actually happening internally and biologically, as you mentioned, but it's also important to note that um, that this is it seems like a very evolutionary process based off of information learned, and that there are some changes. And I'm just curious. Um, it seems like these are all universal biomarkers that all researchers in HD understand. Is that a true statement? And and utilize whenever they're looking at the research components and clinical trials. That's right, and I think. We're lucky in Huntington's disease with one thing that we have really um, amazing community members and patients and families. And they, many people have volunteered for research, people who are G, uh, a young gene carriers who volunteered for studies like PREDICT and TRAC HD and even ENROLL and um, 20,000 people who have volunteered for enroll. And so what we know in Huntington's disease is because of the efforts of, of people being vo involved in research, we are know a lot about the natural history of the, of the disease. We know um, uh, what we think is happening from the very earliest stages to the later stages and and the reason that's important is that we have a kind of a, what i would say is a map of the way the disease occurs and in individuals and that map allows us to develop biomarkers and also allows us to do trials and so that map that we have from people volunteering to be part of research has allowed us to create the Huntington staging system, for example, uh, and the HD young adult study, which I'm running, which is uh, lots of young people who carry the gene, particularly in their twenties with matched controls, um, their volunteering to be in the study has told us a huge amount about the disease 20 or 30 years before onset of the disease. And I think one of the hugely important findings that came out of the study that we published a few years ago was that in individuals who were 25 years before they were expected to develop the disease based on their age and CAG count, everything we measured, brain, sp spinal fluid, thinking tests, 
everything we measured was completely normal. There was no different from aged matched controls. So what that told us was a really important thing was that even if you're born with the Huntington's gene, there's a very long period where it doesn't cause any problems. And the reason that was so important and I felt so excited about the result was it really told us that there was a time that was a true stage zero of the disease where there is nothing to find, no different from matched controls. And it told us about the, the movement into stage one, which is still nothing to find. It's just a change in imaging. But the reason why that was so important is because eventually we will be doing trials in stage zero and one, and we won't be able to do trials effectively in, in those groups, and they tend to be young people, because we now have biomarkers that we can measure that's helping us design trials that will be what I think are prevention trials. I think that we will possibly prevent the disease ever occurring or prevent the disease or delay it so it occurs in very old age. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that the biomarkers have been so important and the volunteering for research has been so important in us being able to develop, for example, the staging system. Yeah, no, that's that's really exciting to have that potential for, um, for intervention, not even intervention, sorry, that's the wrong word, prevention trials and studies, um, especially to our community that we serve with that 35 and under group. Um, and, and I love everything you just said. I'm not even going to try to summarize because it was great. Um, <laughs> so Molly, turning it over to you, I know you mentioned a little bit about how you now, um, even just as a community member, but then also a researcher, find out more about biomarkers. <clears throat> you mentioned HD Buzz. Have you attended any events that have been helpful to kind of understand a little bit more about the science and biomarkers that are happening? What are some of the other tools that, you know, anybody at any time outside of HD Buzz could learn more about this? Yeah, so I have attended um, some conferences and I was lucky to attend HDYO Congress this year. And I find events like that are really helpful in just getting to learn more about the science in an understandable way. Yeah, I think it's it's important, so important to ask questions too. And mm -hmm. I, I use this term often where, especially as I'm talking to people in science that I, because I'm not a scientist, I don't even pretend to be one, um, where I say dumb question amnesty, because it's one of those things <laughs> where I, I feel like this is maybe a silly question, but I'm just not, it's not tracking with me, but it's really important because if you have that question, someone else will. And it is the presenter's job to always um, be able to, to provide that lay terminology that is conversational and understandable for, for the masses. So that's really important. And, and even if you don't feel comfortable approaching them afterwards um, as well. And, and Molly, I'm curious, um, why do you think that it's important for um, the advocacy community, the HD community to understand about biomarkers now that we've kind of rounded out some of these conversation pieces? So I think it's important that the community understands biomarkers because they are the very people that will be putting themselves forward to participate in clinical trials. For example, one of the aims of HD Clarity, which is a multi-site cerebrospinal fluid collection initiative, is to check if the levels of the neurofilament light chain in the blood or NFL corresponds with what is seen in the brain as we've discussed. And if the, adv if the advocacy community can be inspired by the research scientists are currently doing, then not only will it encourage them to participate in scientific studies, but it also helps to build, to build that very important trust in science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that trust is really important because we are, as the community are putting trust in participating in these trials that they're keeping our safety um, at the at the at the forefront of what they're doing but we also need to have them trust it's just that that two-way trust is needed and, in, and unless you're educated on what's happening it's hard to do that no i love that piece of it molly um 
Dr. Tafrizi, I'm curious, you mentioned a little bit about the, the staging system. Um, we see a lot of that when it comes into, um, one, if you've attended any uh, conferences, you will have seen presentations on that. We've had that with our uh, virtual Congress. But also when it comes to inclusion criteria in clinical trials, you're starting to see stage two, stage three. Uh, what does that mean? What is the staging system? So the staging system um, was created a few years ago by a big group of us because we wanted to have the regulatory framework. And what that means is to be allowed to do trials. We wanted to have the regulatory framework to allow us to do trials, not just in patients with quite obvious signs and symptoms of the disease. So up till now, all of the clinical trials have been in people who have had what we call clinical motor onset or clinical motor diagnostic onset. And when I was saying earlier that that was made, that was created in the 70s, the late 70s, before the gene was found. And it was created because people had to be very, very certain of people having a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. So it was made based on very obvious motor or neurological signs. And that meant the diagnosis was made very, relatively late in the course of the disease. But what we know now from all the natural history studies from track, from predict, is that things happen before that point and we also want to do clinical trials before that point. We want to do clinical trials earlier in the course of the disease. So we spent three or four years, we actually spent three years working on how do we create a staging system for Huntington's disease that takes the whole breadth of the disease from birth right through to later stages that allows us to describe the disease across the course and allows us to um, have a staging system that is a universal language that can be used worldwide. And uh, Jenna, you mentioned the cancer staging system, and that's a very famous staging system, which starts with stage zero, stage one, two, three, and four. And every cancer is described with the cancer staging system and treatments are particular for, for that stage that you have. Stage zero treatment will be different from a stage four treatment for cancer. So what we did was we took every measure that had ever been tested in Huntington's disease. We took a large amount of control data from individuals. And then we looked at what are the best measures that look like they tell us about the progression. So we looked at over 1500 measures and the measures that were eventually chosen had been tested in more than two or three groups and had lots of longitudinal data, so measured over time. And what we found was a number of landmarks that when and we measured them in uh, control individuals as well. And we found measures that would change in control individuals versus person who carries the Huntington's disease gene. And it was a lot of work, a lot of uh, looking at, studying, statistical analysis. And we came up with four stages, a stage zero, a stage one, a stage two, and a stage three. And the stage zero is just the presence of the Huntington gene, nothing else. Stage one is when there is a small change in the size of the caudate or putamen volume as measured on brain imaging and nothing else. Stage two is when there is a subtle change in the total motor score or the symbol digit modality thinking test, but a subtle change. And what that means is the very, very early clinical symptoms. 
And stage three, the landmark is a change in function, total functional capacity or independent scale. So before the staging system, all the clinical trials were in HD integrated staging system stage three. Now the trials are moving into HD integrated staging system stage two, which is earlier in the course of the disease. And before clinical motor diagnostic onset, which was the old term. And we now, once we learn more about the trials in stage two, we are also now thinking about how do we do trials in stage zero and stage one. And the way that we're going to be able to do that is through biomarkers. And the reason the HD integrated staging system is important is a number of reasons. One is it will let us do earlier stage trials. The regulators will let us do earlier stage trials. Two is it gives us a framework that can be used for all clinical trials. And three, it allows young people the opportunity to get involved in clinical trials if they wish to. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize it's a research staging only. It's for clinical trials only. And we have to learn more about what we can use in stage zero and one. We're not ready to do those trials just yet because at the moment it's we can't we don't want to do trials that are five years long because that's a long time for someone to be in a clinical trial or to be on a placebo and so we need better measures we need better biomarkers for stage zero and one which is what many people in the hd youth organization and the community may be because we want to be able to be doing our future clinical trials in that group. And actually, I was at a meeting with the European Medicines Agency last week where we were discussing exactly this. And we've had discussions with the FDA about this as well. And we also got a lot of input from patient organizations. And the overwhelming response we got from young people was, why did it all take you so long? Because I'm so glad that this is now being recognized and that actually there is something like a stage zero when there is nothing to find and um and even a stage one where there's very subtle changes to find so um i think this is something that is the staging system is really dependent on biomarkers so yeah. they kind of fit together, if that makes sense. And it is just research. It's not something you go to your neurologist to find out what stage you're in. Um, it's really for research and for clinical trials. No, I think that that's really, that's a, a great description. And, and yes, please don't go to your neurologist and say, what stage am I in? Because that's not, that's not the point of it. And I think you mentioned a couple of things in there that we, that we hear about a lot is, you know, why aren't there clinical trials at an earlier stage of disease progression? And when you look at the length of time that the EMA and the FDA want to see changes, it is a quick timeline when it comes comparatively to Huntington's disease, where it takes many, many years for some of those changes to happen. So this is really important piece of it, because with having better understood or better biomarkers to understand, you can find some of those very nuanced changes to be able to do these clinical trials, which you usually see 18 months or a year because they don't want people to, um, to have to have that burden of participating, but then also the cost of it as well. And, um, and the importance for the scientific community to learn something and then be able to adopt it for either a, a treatment or a future clinical trial or next stage of the study. Well, this has been such an interesting conversation and an important conversation. I wanted to wrap it up by by letting you both share a little bit about why you think it's important for young people to get involved in research. And, and when we say research, we mean observational studies, we mean surveys, we mean registries, we mean um, clinical trials, whatever it might be. So uh, Molly, I'll start with you. Why is it so important for young people to get involved in research? I think without young people getting involved in research, just science simply cannot happen. 
And I know from my perspective, working in research, that the reason I can keep progressing with science is thanks to the community of people that get involved with my research. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's been, um, I know when we were looking at um, the the HGBuzz article that came out about somatic instability, they mentioned the thousands of samples that were um, generously donated um, to the, the people who are going to enroll HD. To, there's just so many different um, important uh, aspects that are taken from, from that time and from those people. It is really, really important to propel that research forward. Dr. Tabrizi. I think it's important to get involved because it gives you a voice. Um, it allows uh, what you think to be heard. And I think Molly has captured it really importantly. By being involved, you're part, being part of the solution. And um, whether it's a blood sample, whether it's a, a more detailed observational study like the HD Young Adult Study, whether it's being part of Enroll, whether it's um, uh, giving part of clarity, giving a spinal fluid sample, the more young people that we can get involved in Enroll, for example, or clarity or giving a blood sample, the quicker we will have clinical trials for that group. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that once we have uh, enough people in enroll that are in young people under the age of 35, we will learn a lot more about biomarkers for that group. The more people that get involved, the more we will learn and the quicker we will be able to test potential therapies in that group. So, it's about being involved, doing something and being part of the solution. And it doesn't always involve that you having to have a genetic test for Huntington's disease. You can be involved at when you're at risk mm -hmm. and it's and it's being part of the solution and being part of the mission that all of us together to find treatments. And I think just to emphasize the importance of being part of studies if you can like enroll because the enroll database and the participants are what is going to help us when it comes to clinical trials and people under the age of 35 because when we want to design one in Europe or design one in North America we will use the uh, enroll database to say is there enough people who are that we have data on for us to be able to do a stage one clinical trial or a stage zero clinical trial. So I would say the most important thing you can do is to get involved. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that's really powerful and a, and a few things to take away and even segment. I think it's interesting that in clinical trials, many times people feel like there's not enough um diversity in where clinical trials can happen. And we know that's for a lot of different reasons because of regulatory challenges, governmental challenges, but then also structural challenges needed in order to actually facilitate the trial. But there are several sites outside of where clinical trials can happen where Enroll is participating. So for those or by doing um, surveys, and I know surveys seem like they that they aren't important, but they really are. And they help provide that opportunity for you all to share your story and to be able to help us as a community, whether it's for advocacy, education, or understanding what lapses there are in, in, in research components. That's all really, really, really important in ways that even if you feel like you don't have the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial because of where you live, there are still ways that you can contribute. And I think it's also important to understand how advocacy and the research communities actually rely heavily on each other, not just for participation, but in talking specifically about neurofilament light and some of these diseases where it has become such a strong biomarker, like in ALS, um, there was a huge movement on the advocacy side to push for those treatments to move forward. And we could be coming up to a close point where those stories matter in advocating for it also to be similar in Huntington's disease. So without understanding what's happening in science and biomarkers and research, we don't, as a community, understand how we can help influence to be able to share our voices to say what's important to us. And 
without sharing that experience, things just don't move forward because then it truly is just a conversation of numbers when you're looking at the number of people who are progressing and what that clinical trial is looking like on the back end. They can't connect the faces and the voices of the community without those two coming together. So I think that that's why um, these conversations are so, 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 so important no matter where you live because everybody's voice does matter whether it's in research mm -hmm. or advocacy for big A or little A for yourself. Um, and I just want to push a little bit um, with with HDYO. We have uh, we launched earlier this year an international survey series that focuses on the perspectives of the community, and it goes across country lines. So it doesn't matter where you live; you can participate. Our next one that we are particularly going to be releasing is going to talk about some of the emotional obstacles and barriers when thinking about research. So that is a perfect example of how you all can participate in research from the comfort of your own home. And we have more coming down the line. So please stay tuned to some of those because that's a great way, again, that we can take it and talk to Dr. Tabrizi to say, this is what we're hearing. These are the pieces we need to educate about. This is some of the focus because this is all, all is so important. Um, as we wrap up, any final thoughts from either of you um, as we as we wrap up this conversation? I just want to say what uh, to emphasize what you said about advocacy. And in our conversations last week, for example, with the European Medicines Agency and in our conversations with the FDA, what they place a huge amount of importance on is the voice of the patient and family community. And you mentioned ALS. Now, ALS community has been really successful in patient advocacy. They have pushed the ALS agenda to the forefront of the minds of the regulators. And we, as a community in Huntington's disease, will work together to really push patient and family advocacy. And that's why your voice is important, because the people the regulators listen to most are you, is not the doctors, not the scientists, not the drug companies, but to the patients and families. So by being part of the advocacy group, you have a lot of power to help change things and to help regulators make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Molly, anything else? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you both for such an interesting discussion on biomarkers. And I hope this has inspired some of the community to get excited about the science that is going on around us. Yeah, it is, it is a tremendous time um, for the science community and Huntington's disease, but we also understand that we are, we want it to move faster and that doesn't alleviate those frustrations that happen. But, um, and I think as we've kind of, hopefully everybody can hear this and feel this, the, the reiteration that you all are participating in your own way and you are the best judge for how you can do that. But there are so many opportunities and it really does matter when you do get involved, whether it is participating in a study, um, a clinical trial, or just by listening here today, you all are making a big difference and, um, and we're all here to support you. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. DePrizi, to Molly, um, for taking a little bit of your time today to share your perspectives and help educate the community as a part of this important conversation. So thank you both. And thank you all for tuning in. Additional resources, please check out hdyo.org or reach out to us. We're only an email away and we're all here to support each other. Take care. Thank you, Jenna. Lovely to see you and Molly. All the best. Bye-bye.